Good evening, everyone. This is the Metaphysical Bible Hangout, and I am Reverend Sherry James, and I am really excited to be with you tonight. Our conversation is based on Emmett Fox's The Mental Equivalent. This is the first uh, of a, a series that we're doing for 2019, and our theme is really com creating a compelling vision for 2019. So we are moving our way through Emmett Fox's The Mental Equivalent. We started last week. This week, we're going to go to the second part, which talks about universal polarity. And we're going to talk about the two poles of creation, the two poles of creation. And my intent for tonight is that when you finish, that you will know what to do uh, to stay motivated, no matter what is going on in your experience. And I shared in the blog post that one of the things that is going around on, on uh, in motivational circles, you'll hear, I won't call any names because I'm not trying to have somebody send me hate mail for their favorite self-help guru, but you'll hear someone say, oh, you know, motivation is crap, motivation doesn't work, you know, and, and motivation is dead and all of that. And I want to kind of dig down behind that because some things people say and it's catchy, but it actually doesn't make any sense. And so I want to kind of pick that apart and give you something that I think you can actually chew on and work with during the week. And then, of course, we're going to come back at the, after we finish the text, and we're going to go back and begin to apply these things. And I'm going to have very specific exercises for you to do from Thursday to Thursday that you're then going to come back and report on. So um, very, very different format for the Bible Hangout. Um, that came out of a suggestion from, uh, from one of the uh, attendees that we want to make this material practical. And so I want to make sure that, that we are able to do that for you. And so um, just... FYI, that, that's coming down the pipeline. Um, but first, we do everything with prayer. And so I just ask that you just send to yourself and be open to what the Spirit wants to do in this moment right now. Whether you are attending live or you are watching back on YouTube or Facebook or some other means, we just give thanks and praise right now for what the Spirit wants to do through us. We intend to live our very best life. We intend to release the best of us into expression. We know that us living full out makes life better, not just for ourselves and not just for our families, but for the world. That we each have contributions that if we don't give them, the world misses out. And so we make a promise to ourselves and to one another as, as accountability partners for each other that we won't let each other check out before we let our gifts out into expression. And so we're holding our feet to the fire to write our book, to put out our plays, to release our music, to put together our inventions, to move forward and, and to create the things that God has ordained us to do. We take that responsibility very seriously. We know that we have been born for a purpose, on purpose. And so we now endeavor to walk boldly and audaciously in that purpose. In the name and nature of Jesus the Christ. We affirm that this is so, and so it is, and amen. All right, let's get to it. Okay, so last week what we said was that planning is the highest form of faith, that when you plan, what happens is inherent in the planning process is the belief that what I'm planning is going to work out. Inherent in the planning process is a belief that what I am planning is going to work out. So just sitting down to write the plan begins to build the mustard seed of faith that Jesus talked about. This next piece, I want to talk about what happens when the plan doesn't work and what you can do about it. When you finish this, I want you to be able to have some very practical things that you can do this week even before we get into the exercise part and then at the end of the, this series or end of this four weeks together, first four weeks together, but some things that you can do today to begin to approach your plan differently. So I think it's important to talk about just how plans work and to understand really how creation works. Every created thing gets created in the same way. Everything happens the same way. This you know, one of the reasons that you can trust God, that you can trust the friendliness of the universe, that you can trust the, 
the, the joy and the peace of the universe is that everything happens the same way. It, it looks like it might be different in different places, but actually it's the same thing that you, it, two things come together to produce a third thing. Two things come together to produce a third thing. Anything that's ever been produced, that's how it happens. Now, uh, Emmett Fox uh, talks about this as the law of polarity. It is a cosmic law. It cannot be violated. Every time, anything that exists, you, me, the tree, the whatever, two things came together and then you, out of it came a third thing. So in the organic world, we can talk about it like parenthood. We've got the father, we've got the mother, and then we get a child. In the inorganic world, it's the same process, but it's the same, it, it, it has different words, but it's the same process. You've got some kind of activity, you've got meet some kind of material, and the activity meets the material, becomes the production. Uh, those of you that have been students of New Thought, if you've been in Unity or Divine Science or Science of Mind, you, or UFDL, you've heard it said this way, mind, idea, expression. Mind being the term for God, idea being the term for the Son of God, or I am, and then the expression being the coming together of I am with the mind of God. That I am takes an idea from the mind of God and then expresses it, and you get an expression. You also hear it as thought, feeling, manifestation. So you have the thought, it gets married with a feeling, and then there's the manifestation. But every process says the same thing. It says you start with one thing, whether that's the father, the activity, the thinking, or whatever. You marry it with the second thing, whether it's the mother or the material or an idea. And out of that comes the third thing, which is the child. And so if we take the example of, say, your, your business, you have the thinking about your business. That's the father. You have the available resources, the womb, that's the mother, and the combination of your thinking about your business and the available resources come together and produce the child, which is the expression, your business. It's the same everywhere. So it's just getting how it works. And so whenever you're working on a plan, you can begin to diagnose what is the problem with the father or is the problem with the mother? Because maybe the problem is that I've got all the resources, but my thinking is jacked up. So I can't get I can't get a worthwhile <laughs> sound bad. I can't get a worthwhile child because his daddy over here ain't thinking right. Right? Or <laughs> sorry. Um the obviously I'm talking about ideas, people. I'm not talking about actual men and women. <laughs> but you 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 have the the thinking. Let's say you have the you don't really have a whole lot. You got some grand plans, right? The thinking is is next level. But you've got limited resources. So the mother, the womb is not right because you're not working with enough resources. So the child is always going to be a, a reflection of the father and the mother, no matter what it is. Now, when your plan is not working, when your plan is not working, it's saying that there's a problem with one or more pieces of the equation. Where most people fall down, is with the mother or with the, the, the feeling. This is where most people fall down. It's either the thinking or the feeling, could be both, but most people fall down when it comes to feeling. And mainly because they don't understand their emotional power. They give the lion's share of their emotional power to people, places, and things that they don't want in their lives. So you ask someone, someone let's say the, the person comes and they want to express their divine nature. And they say, you know what? I am divine. In fact, you can see it on Sunday. You give people affirmations. We, we're starting to sing it up church. We're going to do an affirmation. We, we're put, hey, and actually say this is allowed. We're changing our service up church. Our service is changing. We're preparing to stream our services. So we're streamlining our service. And you, you know how people love change. So the service is getting ready to change. So when you feel the change and, the, and you get that wonderful feeling that you get when things change, just breathe. Okay. So, but you see when people, we're going to do a, a, an affirmation of power. And you always see when people are doing an affirmation and you'll say, well, I am a rich child of God. And it's like, I am a rich child of God. 
And it's like, you don't even believe that. Did, did you believe it when it came out your mouth? Like, it, it, it has no energy to it. But you say, hey, what's going on in your world? I, I know you were trying to move. I know some things were, were um, you know, you were trying to come together. You know, what, what's happening with that? Man, I applied everywhere. I can't find an apartment. And the ones I can't find, I can't afford. And, you know, and then, and then my landlord is giving me grief. And this happened and the, that happened and the, and all of their emotional energy is focused in what they don't want. And what they do want doesn't get the bulk of their attention. And so the plan never works out because they don't know how to apply feeling to what they do want. They don't know how to apply feeling to what they do want. I got a comment. Phyllis says, I have become mechanical over the years and feeling seems to disappear. I'm trying to get into, into the feeling, but my robotic self can't come into alignment with my thoughts. Okay. Yes. And we're going to deal with exactly that tonight. And I'm going to talk about exactly what you can do to get past that because I know that experience personally, so let me say that. Um, but Reverend Della taught me this in a really practical way. So every Wednesday night for the last few years of, of her public ministry, she would hold a class in her home in Bel Air. And we would all come to class. And it was, it was probably, Ray, you were there. Uh, at the, the, who else was there? I, I don't think anybody else from Bible Hangout was, is there, that was there. But, but Ray was there um, uh, every Wednesday night. Um, Jody, Wally, Mike, uh, and it was like a little crew of us that always came on Wednesday night. Anyway, Reverend Della, I should give a little backstory. So when we first moved into where we are at First Lutheran, which was probably around 2007, I think 2007, these dates like run together, but I got to get that right. To, around 2007, Reverend Della was 78 years old, and I think it was like a September, and she fell out of the platform. So the, the platform at, at Up Church is, uh, is raised. Um, uh, uh, the platform is raised. And so she was stepping down off the platform and she fell. At 78, y'all, so y'all know what that means. She broke her leg in multiple places and she broke, um, I think, her shoulder bone or, or something. Something here she broke. 78 years old. And of course, they told her, you ain't going to never walk again. And Reverend Della being Reverend Della, you a lie. <laughs> I, I don't accept that. And, but there was a period of time where she had to be in a cast. And her, the muscles in her leg have, have broken atrophy. So she gets herself back to health. And of true to form, she comes back in the church walking. Because she said, when I come back in here, I'm going to be walking. And Barbara McCauley, you can attest to that. She was walking. So... She, um, but in, on Wednesday night, she's sitting in her home and she's sitting for long periods of time. And when you've been sitting for long periods of time, even if you hadn't broken your leg, you've been sitting for long periods of time that it's just, you know, it takes some, some getting up out of the seat. And so every Wednesday night, what would stay with me was watching her, uh, get out of, uh, uh, get out of that seat. And Everybody would, you know, most people would leave. There's a few of us hanging around talking to Reverend Della. And then you'd hear her start to quietly coach herself. And she would say, come on down. Come on down. You got in the seat. You can get out of it. You got in the seat. You can get out of it. And she would literally talk life into her leg. The same leg that had fallen and that she was told at 78, you're going to spend the rest of your life in a wheelchair. I saw her do that. Now, it would have been very easy for her to take the route of, you know, I'm 80 plus years old. Because at this point, this is a few years after this happened. So we had been at Up Church for a while. So this is like 2009, 2011, somewhere in there. And she very easily could have like taken the route of, okay, well, you know, this happened. And so be it. And my point is, is that that you have the uh, uh, ability to put feeling behind what you want. 
And even with the limitations that you have to face, if you will put feeling behind what you want, what you want will become possible and what you don't want will become irrelevant. If you put, learn to put feeling behind what you want and not behind what you don't want, then what you want will become true for you and what you don't want will become irrelevant for you. In that moment when she is talking life into her body, she is making immobility, which, which haunts many people in their 80s and 90s, irrelevant. And she's making the ability to move. And Reverend Della wasn't somebody who exercised. I, one time I wanted to, <laughs> so I don't want to do these fitness Sundays. I said, Reverend Della, this is you know, coming up with ideas of the assistant minister. I want to do a fitness Sunday. And here's what I want to do. We're going to, we're going to everybody come to church in their workout clothes. And then after church, we're going to go to Kennethon Park and we're going to just walk around the track. It'll be a flat surface. But we're going to all just walk around the track. And she was like, yeah, I'll lead you. I, I, said, but, I said, but you got to come. She was like, okay, I'll come out there. I'll be in my scooter. I said, okay, no. <laughs> you can't do it in your scooter. Like, you, <laughs> so this is not a woman who worked out. This is not a woman who worked out and who believed in working out. I, I want you to get that. It's not like this. She was like a former athlete. Like, she used to joke in, um, in Sunday service, she would say, you know, I'm built for comfort, not for speed, you know. And she said, when I walk, I tip. So her thing was not about exercise. And yet, this 80-plus-year-old woman who rejected exercise could begin to talk to the life in her legs and produce more life. It's not magic, it's a law. It's a cosmic law that what you give your energy to manifests. What you give your energy to manifests. I have a, um, a comment here. Uh-oh, I didn't mean to hit share. Alita says, I hide my feelings because I don't want to be disappointed. Alita, I know that so well. Personally, I know that's how y'all are speaking my, my language. I know that so well. There was a point in my life where things had gotten so bad that I felt like it was foolish to dream. Things had gotten so bad that I felt like it was foolish to dream. And, and what I can tell you is that if you learn how to do it, that fear or that lack of confidence in working the law goes away. But I, I remember that where I just felt like, it felt like I was just being crazy. It felt like I was being absolutely crazy. And what I can tell you is, no, you're not being crazy. That, but you do have to learn how to do it. You do have to learn how to do it. Uh, Constance says, I remember meeting her at, at uh, your POT uh, sessions and she was in the wheelchair. I have a picture with her. Yes. Alita says she's mad at God. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bill says, a well-formed outcome or goal is stated in the positive. Say what we want, not what we don't want. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Yes to all of that. Now, I want to talk about why motivation fades because, again, it is, people say motivation is crap, and I say that's a lie because you need motivation to do anything. But what is happening is that many people are banking on excitement to help them move their plan forward. They, they are banking on excitement to help them move their plan forward. But th that initial excitement, when you think about, you know, when you take that business class or you um, graduate from college or you, you finish some type of accomplishment, there is the high from experiencing that. And then comes the real work. And the excitement wears off. It, it do, that's the part that doesn't last. That um, almost like a honeymoon stage. You know, there's a, they, they talk about the honeymoon stage in relationships. But I think you have a honeymoon stage in, like, everything. You have a honeymoon stage in the job you were, you were, working, you were working right now. Like, where you started and you loved everybody that you work with. And it was just... It was a joy to come into work, and you come in, and it's like Mary Poppins is singing, and you're dancing, and there's even daisies on the floor, even though you're in an office building. And then, like, you know, a few months into it, or let's say maybe a year into it, 
Mary Poppins is not singing. <laughs> you know, it is in your daisies on the floor. You sick of all your coworkers. You just here to get your check. <laughs> you know, so it that that initial excitement absolutely does kind of wear off. So if you're waiting for excitement to take action, then the plan is doomed. If you're waiting for that excitement. And so motivation is not excitement. Motivation is not excitement. This is Emmett Fox speaking. He's saying what we call feeling in connection with thought is really interest. What we call feeling in connection with thought is really interest. Feeling is not excitement. So to your point, Phyllis, the feeling is not, I wouldn't worry so much about the robotic nature of because that's not what you're that's not what you're trying to get around anyway feeling is not excitement true feeling when we're talking about thought and feeling and in the equation of thought feeling manifestation is interested you need to get interested in what you want and interest keeps you going when motivation wears off interest keeps you going when motivation wears off Mental equivalents get built by what you're interested in. Mental equivalents get built by what you're interested in. That's how you create feelings. So if you want help, get interested in help. Every day, read something on health. It could be a blog post. It could be a magazine article. It could be, you could watch a short video on ways to improve your nutrition or whatever aspect of health you're working with. But it's, it's that you start to immerse yourself in a sea of information about the thing that you want to be motivated about. If you want to be motivated about your health, then you need to uh, sink yourself in a sea of information about whatever it is that you want to be motivated on. Interest builds the mental equivalent. So if you are dealing with a money issue, right, what you want to do is begin to study money. And you want to read articles on investment. And it may feel uh, like far away from yourself, but really what, ha what, what, what makes the prayer happen is that you collapse the distance between you and the thing you're praying about. And the way that you collapse that distance is that you begin to study it. Because as you begin to study it, you become familiar with it. And what you feel familiar with, you feel comfortable with. And what you feel comfortable with, you feel like it could be yours. Uh, there's a guy, uh, Ed Milet. Um, he is a, he looks like a bodybuilder, but I don't think he is. I think he was an athlete maybe back in the day, but he was really a real estate guy. And now he goes around, he mo he's a motivational speaker. But he talks about when he and his wife were building their business. And I think he worked for World Financial Group. I think it was just one of those uh, MLMs for financial services. And he, he said every week, once a week, he and his wife, now they were, where were they living? They were washing their clothes in the laundromat, but like living out of a car. It was, it was an amazing, amazing story. But, um, he every once a week they would go to some place in Beverly Hills and just eat. I don't know what they were eating, but they would go somewhere and it was they they were making what they wanted feel familiar to them. And so you, but what you do, what's happening in that, the, the mechanics of that, or the metaphysics of that, is that what they're doing is that they're developing an interest in what it is that they want. That they're putting themselves in, so the, in, a, in a sea of information that, that when you go and let's say that was your dream, when you go and you eat in that Beverly Hills restaurant or you just go and sit in the Beverly Hills restaurant and drink tea, right? That what's happening is you're taking in information and you're, begin, you, you're developing and you're cultivating interest in what it is that you are bringing forward for yourself. You let it become a part of your conversation. You know, you, you talk about the things that you're interested in. So if, if you want to develop an interest in health, let's say, 
then when you get on the phone, especially with the people that are closest to you, begin to talk about health. Let that be a topic of conversation. Follow your favorite health gurus on social media. Be on top of what it is that they are um, sharing. I have a, an interest in brain science and, and in the latest discoveries of new neuroscience. I'm fascinated by the things that they are discovering now in, in neuroscience that we have been teaching for centuries in new thought. That's a whole other conversation. But I'm fascinated by it. I'm, I'm interested in the fact that, that these science guys are saying, just sit and breathe. Hey, we've been saying that. You can come over to 600 West Queen Street. We've been teaching that, but okay. So what happens is that this steady drip on the mind creates interest. The steady drip on the mind creates interest, and interest builds the mental equivalent. So it isn't so much that you're sitting and trying to get the feeling in an affirmation, you probably can't get the feeling in an affirmation because you don't have anything behind it. But if you begin to fill yourself with information about the thing that you want, then when you make the affirmation, you're no longer dealing with uh, that, that, that sense of, of dryness uh, in, in terms of, of your uh, affirmation. Now, to keep the motivation from fading, because that's really the thing that you want, right? Who hasn't gone to a panorama of truth or a unity conference or wherever you've gone and, and you came back and you were on fire for like three weeks? <laughs> you know, Phyllis says, I am mentally rehearsing some event in the next six months and started to release some happy feelings. But when I get to, too excited, I seem to shut myself down. That's okay. Be consistent with the, with, the, with the mental rehearsal. And I love that you call it a mental rehearsal because that's one of my favorite terms from uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza. But be consistent with it because it, when you're establishing the habit, it's the frequency, not the intensity that matters. When you're establishing the habit, it's the frequency and not the intensity. And the mind will catch up. And, and the comfort with excitement uh, uh, will, 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 uh, will, will come. But the main thing is, is the consistency of it. So in terms of just keeping the motivation from fading, you've got to source motivation from the right place. So when, when you hear motivational speakers say, you know, motivation is crap. And, you know, in fact, nobody wants to call themselves a motivational speaker anymore. They are, I'm a transformation agent. Um, most people source their motivation from an external event. So it's a positive video, it's a powerful performance. Um, I remember going, to, uh, like I love to watch, uh, uh, no, not this, I'll back up, I'll go a little bit earlier. I went to a Janet Jackson concert, uh, this was years ago, and the, the level of excellence in terms of her presentation, was, I mean, it was otherworldly. This woman <laughs> just was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. You could, I mean, there were so many little, minute, de just details of excellence in her show, from the dancing to the costumes to the pageantry to the just to the experience itself. I mean, the whole thing was just amazing. And I remember just being in the Staples Center, and I was like, let me just drink this in. Let me just drink this in because I just want to just drink in all of that excellence because. I was like, I want this kind of excellence coming out of me. Like it was, it was just, she was, she was on, on fire. And I'm telling you, I left that performance and I was on fire for like three entire weeks. And then true to form, it fades. Or I go to, I remember coming back from Panorama of Truth when we were in Jamaica. I think that was the one. We were in Jamaica. And I, I, I had hit the reset button. And when I came back, I was working out every day. Like, what? I'm going to get my sexy on. I was like, let's, let's make it happen. And that went on for probably six entire months. <laughs> okay. So the moment that the performance ends, 
the motivation begins its decline. Now, it might peter out in six days. It might peter out in six weeks, six months. But if you are way, if you are pulling the motivation from an external event, it's going to fade because that's the nature of it. Everything in this three-dimensional world gets used up. The, this bottle of water, eventually it's going to get used up, right? Whatever, whatever it is, that it's going to get used up. That's the nature of things in this three-dimensional world. But motivation that comes from an internal source never fades. If you think about it, you never have to motivate yourself to do what interests you. You never have to motivate yourself to do what interests you. Your interests drive your action. I have an interest in, like I said, brain science. I, I am, I'm on it when it comes to brain science because I'm just, I'm fascinated by it. Like it's just, it's amazing the stuff that they're discovering in terms of just the rehabilitative nature of the brain. It used to be believed that, you know, the brain formed and then it was static for the rest of your life. And, and, and then of course you've got Alzheimer's coming in. Folks are scared out of their, folks are scared out of their minds as far as, you know, Alzheimer's is concerned. And they, and, and rightfully so, they're worried, like, what do I do? And, and then they're saying, well, you can look, you know, years earlier and you can see the evidence. No, but don't do that. Get up. Don't play with that. I know, don't play with it. I know. You can see the evidence of it years in advance before it shows up in the form of someone, you know, losing their memory. And just all of this fear that's around that. And then to learn all the things that we can do with the brain and, and, and then learning the different natures that, that this, that the prefrontal cortex and how to like, that you can produce reactions in, in the uh, prefrontal cortex that shut off the fight or flight brain. And I mean, just, oh man, let me tell you, I don't have to motivate myself to read anything about the brain because I'm interested in it. If I scroll past a video on YouTube and I have enough time and this video is within the length of what I can watch, I'm going to sit there and watch it because I have an interest in neuroscience. I have an interest in, in, in what they're discovering. One of the, now this is exciting. So the AI that is out there today, today, is such that they can have you put on those like VR headsets and they can put you, this all suggested, but they can put you in the body of a baby and it feels like you're in the body of a baby. And it feels like you now have all the limitations of being a baby. That's fascinating to me. And then, so what they're looking at from a positive standpoint is that if you have trouble with like confidence or self-belief or um, just, just being willing to take action, that through the use of AI or this, be, this uh, virtual reality technology, that you can literally step into experiences to build that for yourself. I think that's powerful. Like what? You can download confidence. Anyways, my point is, is that you don't have to motivate yourself to dig into that or do something about that which interests you. And so the motivation for external events will fade. And the reason it fades is because it had nothing inside of you to stand on. The motivation for external events fades because it had nothing inside of you to stand on. When it has something to stand on, it doesn't go away. And this is why without an internal interest, the motivation can't live. Joe says, I've been watching every video on RV traveling and seeing myself driving across, across country and also shut down. Now I take a break and make a gratitude list. Okay, got to explain that last little bit and also shut down. I don't know what that means. But like you said, it's, what you're interested in. I don't have to make myself, okay, here, how about this, Joe? I would have to make myself watch an RV video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I have two people in my life who have 
shut down their lives wherever they were living and, got, and, and sold everything and then went on the road on an RV. One of my classmates from college uh, did an entire U.S. tour with her RV. And another friend who was a, a, a teamster out here in L.A. put everything, I don't know if she put it in storage or whatever she did, but basically she got an RV and went on the road. And I see their videos and and uh, and and they have no interest for me. So I, I watch like two seconds and it's like, okay, that's enough. I'm up, I'm up on their journey. And not that I don't care about my friends because I do, but I don't have an interest in it. Oh, I got it. You said you get overwhelmed and shut down mentally. Got it. Persist. Persist. Because it's, it, what, what's happened is as you do it, you make it comfortable for yourself. And you make it familiar for yourself. And what's familiar for you becomes real for you. And when it becomes real for you, it's just a matter of time to manifestation. So, Phyllis says, this is where the subconscious mind comes in. We have to give it instruction because it does not know right from wrong. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Now, so you, thank you, Phyllis, because you just set up my next point. Can you consciously generate motivation that lasts? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. You can consciously generate motivation that lasts. And you do it by cultivating an interest in what you want. So what do you want? Joe, you talked about traveling cross country. Maybe, Joe, don't watch an entire video. Maybe just give yourself five minutes and watch five minutes every day and grow your capacity. If that makes sense. Sometimes when we're starting out, it's like we want to go hard in the paint. And what we really need is we need to go small to go big. So I'll give you an example. Don't y'all laugh at me because, well, I don't care. Because I'm, I'm, I'm optimizing before, I, I'm standardizing before I optimize. So with habits, you go small in order to go big. With habits, what you do is you start little in order to, do, to go bigger and you build capacity. What happens is that when people go big, they burn out because they don't have capacity. So I don't even know if I want to say this on video. I probably should like stop the tape and say it and then turn it back on. But anyway, I have a really short workout, like really, really, really short workout. So do not laugh at me. I work out five minutes a day and then that's it. Five, one, two, three, four, five, five entire minutes. But let me tell you why. Because I'm interested in working out every day. I'm interested in working out every day. And right now, where I am is in the habit formation stage. If I went hard in the paint, and I could, because I got that kind of personality, I would burn out and I would fall away. I've done that. Remember I told you POT? I came back from POT. I exercised for six whole months, and then I quit. I'm interested in not quitting. And so what's happening is I'm building capacity. Now, I will increase that time over time, but I'm building capacity. And so what, when you say you get overwhelmed and you shut down mentally, what I would say is don't watch as much of the video. Watch it every day. Study it every day, but only do maybe five minutes, maybe six minutes, and, 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 and then let your capacity for it grow naturally. Alita says, I was reading something that said to demand your subconscious to find ways to demonstrate that whatever it is that you want, really, wow. Okay, so let me tell you how that works. Y'all teach teaching my lesson. Thank you. Okay, so that's exactly where I was going next, Alita. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Alita. So what happens is that you, you cultivate interest, excuse me, you, you develop motivation that lasts by cultivating interest. Now, you've got to get how the subconscious mind works. The subconscious mind has a latching mechanism, like, a, like it latches on, right? Like a, um, you know, glove, whatever, I don't know, a leech. That's a bad image. But it latches on. It latches on to whatever you put in front of it naturally you don't have to do anything about it you don't have to make it happen it naturally does that everybody does it's like baby being born knowing how to suck it, it it's natural to you so what happens is that you 
put what you want in front of the subconscious mind consistently every day, preferably at the same time every day. And, and what happens is that just the natural tendency of the subconscious mind, it will begin to latch on to the idea of whatever it is that you want. So for you, Joe, with watching the videos, it's one, probably not watch as much, like don't watch to the point of feeling overwhelmed. Watch, well, like watch, uh, leave yourself wanting more, right? So stop it like, you know, well before the point of overwhelm. Advertisers know this, and they utilize this natural tendency of the mind to get you to buy their stuff. And so what they tell you is, Nestle is pure life, right? That's a little advertising on Nestle is pure life, right? And it's pure life, and it's pure life, and they keep putting it out there. And then one day you're in the store, and, you, and maybe there's an article that you don't even know was sponsored by the manufacturer on leading a pure life. And, but you read the article and it hit points that matter to you. And now you're in the store and you see pure life. And it's like, oh, you gotta choose between what? I'm gonna buy water. I'm gonna choose this one. Cause I want pure life. So the, there's a nature of it. If you're working on finding a place to live, study places to live. Like go sight, see where you want to live. It, 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 we have to work with the mind the way the mind works. If you're interested in being employed, this is something that, that I know people do. You, you, you need employment, but in your mind, you're past a certain age, and so there are these certain restrictions that are on you because you're past a certain age. And so, so you, you, it's like you shut down the possibility in your mind before you ever explore. But if you went out and explored and, explored and said, if, if, if I want a job and the Father has put in me the desire for gainful employment, then there must be a job out here that's right for me. If I want a job, and the Father has put it on my heart that I want a job, then there must be a job out here that's right for me. And so I begin to read and study employment, but I never let the idea go. I just keep putting it in front of my face in different ways. I do what the advertisers do. I believe you should advertise to yourself. <laughs> Barbara says, too funny, while tossing and packing stuff, a book fell out in front of me from the closet. The power of your subconscious mind. A class I took several times. Different levels of understanding, different clarity, yes. Uh, Constance says, the thought came for me to become the advertiser and marketer to my subconscious with that was what I desire consistently every day, even if only for five or ten minutes. Five or ten minutes is all you need. You really don't need more than that. Five or 10 minutes is all you need. So bottom line, you want to put in front of your mind the kinds of things that you want it to latch onto. And so if you, whatever it is, so I'll, I'll show you something that I do. Um, so I, I made a, a, I've shared this with you guys last week, but I, I, I took it up or not this week. Because I mean to have my stuff. And so I have my, my goals here, and I'm working with, um, I, this is a book I can recommend, 12-week year. Definitely take a look at this. Brian Morin and Michael, Michael Lennington, 12-week year. Awesome, awesome book. So I won't go into the concept of what they talk about, but it's a way to structure your year to get more done. Anyway, but I put the goals literally on a sheet, and then I write the goal system. So, uh, well, here. So I have a, a goal in this first quarter to lose nine pounds. That's the goal. So my goal system is I work out for five minutes every morning. I stretch for 10 minutes every night. Um, I log all of my food. I have an uh, app. Uh, I don't eat after 7 o'clock. I avoid all sugar. I avoid all soda. That's the system, right? So every morning I sit down with a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and I just 
read through the goal, right? Because, and, and I, will, I will tell you that when I started, the only thing I had was the exercising in the morning and the exercising at night. But every morning as I've concentrated on the goal, spirit will give me a new habit to add to the system. So, so, my, so the goal has a habit system so that when I get to March 31st, which is the end of my first 12 week year, when I get to March 31st, I can look at my results and I can say, well, I did this, 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 and this, and, and where were my, what, what were my results? But what's happening is I'm cultivating, by reading it over and over again, I'm cultivating an interest in what it is that I want. And so, say, please don't, please don't, please don't, leave the room, go back, leave. Okay. Uh, right here, right here, right there. No, no, go on that side. Go on that side and do it. That box right there in that box. Yeah, you take the whole box. Okay. Okay, draw whatever I want. Draw whatever you want. Like Casper the zombie. Yes, you can draw zombies. And plants. And plants. You can draw plants and zombies. Okay. So what's happening when I am revisiting this, my mind is latching on to it and I'm developing an interest in it. All of a sudden, my mind is getting attuned to information on health, information on nutrition, information on exercise, because I keep sitting down with it every morning. This is, a, this is a without fail, sitting down with it every morning every morning sitting down and going through the goals. And what's happening is my, my subconscious mind, the natural tendency of it is that it's just latching on to it. And so different things are occurring to me or I'm noticing different pieces of information, but what's happening is that I'm cultivating it through the steady drip, through the steady drip. Now, sometimes it feels like it, it's hard to let go of the negative thoughts. It can feel like, yes, I get I'm supposed to like think positively, but I'm having trouble thinking positively. And so I want to give you, I want to, again, I think it's I think it's so helpful to understand how the mind works because then you could do something about it. So we know that the mind naturally latches on to whatever we put in front of it. So the question is, how do I start latching on to stuff I don't want? I'm reading this part verbatim from um, Emmett Fox's uh, uh, Mental Equivalent. It's in, I don't remember what page it's on, but if, it's in the link that I sent you guys in the email. He says, the only way to expunge a wrong mental equivalent is to supply the opposite. Think the right thing. The right thought automatically expunges the wrong thought. If I say to you, don't think of the Statue of Liberty in New York, you know what you are thinking about. You are not thinking of anything else but the Statue of Liberty. There she is, complete with torch in her hand. I said, don't think of her, but you do. Now, I'm going to say that some time ago I visited near Springfield, Illinois, a perfect reproduction of the village of New Salem, as it was in the days of Abraham Lincoln. Even the log cabin is furnished as it was in his day. The National Park Commission has done it all. Now, you have forgotten the Statue of Liberty for a few seconds, haven't you? You have been thinking of New Salem. I gave you a different idea. That is the key to the management of your mind, the management of your thinking, and therefore the key to the management of your destiny. Do not dwell on negative things, but replace them, supplant them with the right constructive things. The law of mind is that you can only get rid of one thought by substituting another. It is thought replacement. When I read that, and I read this, I've read this little text many times, but probably the first time I read it was in the early 2000s. It changed everything for me because I got it that you don't fight your thinking. 
What happens when you fight your thinking is that you keep the thinking that you don't want alive because now it's getting the fullness of your attention. Fighting negativity keeps it alive. You kill negative thoughts by replacing them with positive thoughts. It's, I always think of the story of Lot and his wife. Lot represents the thinking. His wife, who turns to salt, represents the feeling. That when you are leaving, your, whatever your Sodom and Gomorrah is, that if you will just keep putting one foot in front of the other, that those feelings will calcify and blow away with the winds of time. Because it's only the feeling that looks back and thinks about where you've been. The thinking keeps moving forward. It's the feeling nature, the feeling side of us that looks back at that relationship that wasn't good for us. It's the feeling that looks back at that job that we really weren't happy in, but now that we're challenged financially, we wonder should we have stayed here. It's the feeling that looks back. But if you keep putting one foot in front of the other, if you keep replacing the thought, if you keep cultivating the new feeling, in time, the negative feelings will die off because they won't have your attention. They will have been starved out of you. I don't think for one moment that Reverend Della didn't recognize the limitations of her body. I don't think for one moment she had faced an aneurysm. She had had diabetes. She had walked into a plate glass window and lost several pints of blood. She fell when she was 78 and broke her leg and her shoulder. I am sure that the words of her doctors and the eyes of those, uh, the judging eyes of those, of the people who interacted with her were all things that she had to contend with. But her result proved her success in ignoring those thoughts. And they demonstrated the mastery and the dominion and the authority that she had over her own body. She showed me that not only do right thoughts held in mind produce right results, but they also get rid of wrong results because she couldn't have gotten out of that chair night after night after night without assistance if she had been thinking about what it meant to be an 80-plus-year-old woman. So you, 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 this stuff works. And even in the midst of the limitations, if you will give thought to what you do want, that you will literally incrementally stair step your way out of the limitation. That goes for your finances, your health, your relationships, whatever it is, you will stare, incrementally stair step your way out of it. It will no longer be an issue for you. What you have to do is you have to persist. And so what you need, and this will be one of the exercises that we'll work with in the four weeks, is that you need the consistency. You need the consistency. You need some way to be consistent because most people, most people give up before the old mental equivalent falls away. When the feelings start looking back from where you've been, where you're leaving, you turn around and look with them. And now you're back in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so what you have to be able to do is have mind hacks. Now, I've talked to you guys about trackers, habit trackers. One of the ones that I use is, I have a habit tracker called Habit Bull that I use on my phone. And I tell you, it, it, it's so simple. It's so simple. So one of my habits is I read every day. I want to look for the monthly. Um, so it's a mind hack. So this is one, did you review your goals and vision, right? So that, that means, did I sit down and do this? <clears throat> and so the dark circles mean I completed it. For this is for the month of January. And you can see that I completed every, like I didn't miss a day. But what's happening with this is that the mind doesn't want to see any blanks. So I'm psyching myself out in order to accomplish what it is that I want to accomplish. I'm not leaving it to chance. So you want to get clear on what it is that you want, and then you just want to hold it in front of your mind until it manifests. Now, a couple things I want to leave you with. Oh, wait, I got a comment. Uh, Phyllis says, I had one client who broke her hips, and we were trying to be so cautious we bought her wheelchair. 
But in her mind, she was going to climb those stairs again and walk to the store to get her cigarettes. She made it happen. She held the vision until she manifested it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Listen, whatever will get you out of the seat. If it's the cigarettes, make it happen. Absolutely. <laughs> whatever you do, don't strain. This, you know, we, I, 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 I am amused by some of the things that I'm seeing out in the field of personal development because it's a field that I see myself making a mark in. And there's a lot of stock that's placed in physical strength and mental toughness. That's, that's the buzzword right now, mental toughness. How mentally tough are you? Do you have grit? You know, and we just, we value people that can throw off negativity and keep going. And the only thing I would say is don't be fooled by appearances. Who you are will show up. True mental toughness is gentle. If you want to see someone who's mentally tough, think of Jesus. True mental toughness is gentle. We all want to go hard in the paint, but you need to relax. One of the first things that we teach you when you come to a church is to relax. And the reason that we do that is because your mind shuts down when you tense up. Your mind shuts down when you tense up. So you need to relax because when you strain, what happens is that you create this internal resistance that compromises your outcome. So every extraordinary demonstration that you have ever seen required a relaxed, calm, non-resistant mind. If you look at... I, people that I admire. I love watching uh, Steph Curry. I love watching Serena Williams. She has a new commercial out that is just awesome. It is amazing. And she looks fabulous. Uh, I love watching uh, Miss Beyonce. She does her thing. Uh, I love watching Oprah. These women are just, oh, and my, my new fascination is Stacey Abrams. Uh, I just think she's just a bee's knees, you know, but many, many, many powerful people who are stepping into their own, defying odds, demonstrating what's possible. I love that that uh, Naomi, I'm about to call her Osaka, but I don't think that's her last name. I think that's her mom's last name. But the, the young uh, Haitian and Japanese tennis player, I love how she's coming up on the scene. I just, I just love extraordinary performance. If you talk to any of them or read anything in, in, in their interviews, what you will find is that in order for them to demonstrate, they had to relax. They had to get on top of their breathing and they had to get control of their mind. It always. And, and they couldn't deliver their best performance until they learned to do that. They had the talent, but it was the mastery of the mind and the body that allowed them to demonstrate. And that's the same thing for you. In order for you to get the best out of you, in order for you to demonstrate true mental toughness, you need to relax. You need to slow down. And you need to go in and get to a single idea. And then you have the ability to do what looks like that, that fat, that, you know, we look at the fast activity that happens when someone's in the zone and we think that they're going fast in their mind. But in actuality, they have slowed down. Mm, Andrea uh, says, mental toughness is gentle persistence. Yes. Mental toughness is gentle persistence. That's what it is. It's easy, does it? And so you cultivate a calm mind through consistent, daily, deep breathing. And the... Um, who was it, the five to 10 minutes? I think, Constance, you said that. So I think of the deep breathing the way that I think of working out. I don't have to work out all day to look good. I just need to work out consistently every day, right? So if I'm doing 10 minutes every day, then I don't, in fact, you can't do three hours of workout on Monday and think that that's going to carry you all the way to the next Monday because that's not how it works. So it's the same approach with your breathing. If you can consistently practice deep breathing once a day for five or 10 minutes, what you'll find is that the same way that working out consistently every day, that your body is more efficient as you, while, even while you're not working out, the same thing is true with your breathing, that if you will breathe five to 10 minutes, deep breathing, five to 10 minutes 
every day that even when you're not actively practicing deep breathing, that your breath will be better and that you will breathe uh, uh, more deeply throughout your day. And so I, I put a link in the blog post uh, of a YouTube video. There's a couple of different like breathing videos that are out there on YouTube that are wonderful to help you to breathe because you have to slow down to go faster. It sounds counterintuitive, but when you strain, you actually close off the creative nature of your mind. And so in order to get into that zone and do what looks extraordinary to the average person who hasn't studied this, that is that you have to slow down and get to a calm mind. Now, the last piece of this, and I'm, if, let me know if there are any questions. The last piece of this, because we've been talking about the feeling, this whole thing we've been concentrating on the feeling, and we said that it's thought plus feeling gives us manifestation, and where most people fall down is on the feeling. But sometimes there's a problem with the thinking. And so the beauty of just calming down is that when you calm down, you can get clarity. If you could get that there is no problem that exists for which is there's not a solution already present, then the, the, uh, the discerning the solution is simply a matter of you calming down. And so you, you, you have to choose what you want. You have to say what's important to you. Mom. Babe, I'm not finished. Give me one second. Come here. Just give me one second. Give me one second. Go ahead. <laughs> give me one second. Uh, not yet, not yet. Just let me finish. No, my, no, my teeth do there. Yes. Tear it up. But I was like really playing with it. You did? Okay. Okay, well, go ahead. I'll come help you fix it. Okay. Okay. Uh, may we email you testimonials regarding how thoughts and divine directions brought or bring about? Yes, please. Please, please, please. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you, you guys have my email. Jordan, stop. Jordan, please stop. Please stop. Please okay. Stop. Go downstairs. Ow! Oh. Go downstairs. Go downstairs. <laughs> yes, Phyllis. You should also practice deep breathing when you are also eating a meal. Yes. 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 Excellent. Excellent point. Um, you should practice deep breathing when there's a five-year-old that interrupts your class. So. Oh. <laughs> Um, choosing what you want. So sometimes we, we don't manifest because we haven't taken time to get clear on what we want. And I'll tell you an experience that really taught me something. So on Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays, I work in a financial services office. And now this is anecdotal. I haven't done like scientific studies, but one of the things that we do when we're doing workshops is that we always call and talk to the people that are coming to the workshop and we want to get a sense of who's going to be there, kind of where they fall in terms of their net worth, you know, are they high net worth, they, do they have assets in terms of retirement, or are they, you know, don't really have a whole lot of assets. Um, some of that is just to help us understand who's there. It's also, it makes us, makes us clear on like what we can offer and whether we can actually be of assistance to people who are in the room. But I noticed something. I noticed, because I'm the one that's making the phone calls to confirm the guests and to, to, do, to go through the questionnaire before they get there. I noticed that people who had assets, that they were also clear on what was important to them. Because what we would ask them, it, we, we specialize in retirement planning. And so what we would ask them is, um, you know, what are some of your concerns about retirement? And the people who, almost without fail, the people who had assets would say, well, I'm concerned about this, 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 and this, or these are the things that are important to me. But they were very, 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 very clear. And I could literally take great notes. The people who didn't have assets, also didn't have clear goals. It's anecdotal. I didn't sit there and do a study and compare and all of that, but it was something that I started to notice because I was making so many phone calls to confirm people for the workshops that we were given. 
And it made me think there is something to clarity. And the thing is, is that, that people who are unclear on their goals are not just unclear on their goals, they're unclear in other areas of their lives because how you do anything is how you do everything. There is something valuable about just taking the time to really understand what it is that you want. It is never too late to do that work. Because Maybe you say, you know, oh, I'm in my 60s and I didn't save when I was in my 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, and oh, whatever. And I'm saying to you that even right where you are in your 60s, in your 70s, in your 80s, that you can begin to get clear and it will make a difference for the rest of your life. It is not too late for you. It can feel like that. And the world will make you feel like that. And I'm telling you as a spiritual leader, and what I know about the mind and the ability of the mind to create reality and being taught by an 80 plus year old woman who talked life into her body and got up out of chairs that doctors and everybody else probably thought that she couldn't have, that it is not too late for you. You got work to do. Now, let me not be, ain't no jokes here. <laughs> you know, you got work to do, but it is not too late for you. And so, but you do have to get down to business. And so one of the ways that you can begin to get clear is to calm down, calm down, to practice the deep breathing, to do it every day. It will begin to center your mind. It will begin to repair areas of your brain. It will begin to restore areas of your heart. And even at 60, you will begin to do things that at 30 you thought would never be possible for you. But you've got to be willing to do the work. You've got to be willing to persist through that internal resistance. So you have to decide what it is that you want. There's no, this universe, you know, you, you can't walk into a restaurant and say, bring me something good to eat and think that you're going to have a good experience every time. Maybe, you know, the right restaurant is kind of, you know, you'll get something that you like, but they might bring you salmon with capers and you don't like capers, but you didn't say what you wanted. So they brought you according to what their taste was. And it's the same thing with this universe is, is that you say, well, you know, I'm going to leave it up to God. No, <laughs> that's not how God created you. He, he created you to be a chooser. He created you to be a chooser. He gave you the power of choice. He gave you free will. And, and handing it back to God is not how this thing works. <laughs> that, that, that's not how it works. The other thing is that don't rush this process. Take your time and figure out what it is that you want. Really, really take your time. Yes, Bella, she says, uh, last week you said, command ye me. Yes, that's from Isaiah 45, 11. Command ye me. Concerning the works of my hand, command ye me. Tell me what you want. Tell me what you want. So the other benefit of just being still is that clarity. Really, really, really getting clear on what do I want? What's important to me? And, and don't think that it's going to come in one session. I used to think that. I used to think that, well, I couldn't sit down and in one goal writing session figure out what I want. It may take you a year to figure out what you want. But here's where, 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 how you won't find out, is that you never sit down and begin the process. So you may have to sit, it's just like, um, you know, when I work with these goals, these goals are not static, they're living goals. And as I work with them, they change. They get more clear. And then as I sit with them long enough, some of them I realize, oh, you know what, that's not really that important to me. And then I get rid of the goal. Or... I may find out that there's something I meant to put on the sheet or should have put on the sheet, but didn't put on the sheet. And so I added, added there. So the, the, the clarity that comes, just know that it's okay if it takes you a year to figure out what you want. But you've got to sit down with it every day, and you've got to be willing to do that work. And if you're willing to do that work, the Spirit will never leave you. God will never leave you hanging. Reverend Della had this song that she used to sing, and I only got some of the lyrics here, but I did, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> oh, but she would say, 
I need to be still and let God love me. I need to be still and let God love me. When the people of the world start to push and shove me, I need to be still and let God love me. And then she would say, give it to God and release it. Give it to God and be free of it. If there's a need in your life, he'll take it. Just give it to God and be free. When you're calming yourself, whatever it is, God has your back. God always has your back. And when you relax and get into that calm state, you will know that. Thank you so much for tonight. I really, really, really appreciate you. I'll put the links for everything we talked about down in the show notes. Those of you that are watching this back on YouTube. Uh, we will, in a few weeks, we're going to do a whole practical lesson around this one. And uh, we'll have work pages and all that. Um, any questions? Any, any questions? I, this book is so amazing. I'm so thankful. Um, let me know if you need my email. Will there be a, oh my God, let me tell you what we're doing for Lent. Where's my bag? I think my bag is too far away for me to share it with you. We are, yes, Lent, Lent is coming, y'all. We are trying to take Lent to the next level. We are doing Key to Yourself, Venice Bloodworth is the book. Key to Yourself, Venice Bloodworth. And we are, we, we sat down, we're working out a whole program. We got some special stuff for those of you that will be attending online or, or remotely from other parts of the world. And it's going to be amazing. I like, I'm so excited about Lent. Like, yes. yes. Um, we're also in the process of purchasing video equipment. So we will be videotaping our sermon series. So you'll get the full experience. Um, what else? Uh, oh man, it's so much good stuff. It's so much good stuff. Um, so what we're going to do is, March, Lent doesn't start until March 6th, Wednesday the 6th. So we're going to do, hi, so we're going to do um, a kickoff on Sunday the 3rd. Our dance team is performing. You're just letting everybody see you. Our dance team is performing. Uh, we're doing a whole, like, you know, sis boom ba, <laughs> rah, rah, rah. Come on your mouth. <laughs> Mm. All right. Uh, so Lent is going to start March 3rd because look, they, gotta be quiet, gotta be quiet. okay. Lent is going to start March 3rd uh, for us, meaning that's going to be the kickoff Sunday. And then Ash Wednesday is March 6th. And then it goes all the way through to Easter. So yeah, we've, we've got a whole thing planned. But key to yourself is the text. Uh, we'll be uh, coming out with our Lent yeah. kit in the next couple of weeks. So you'll, you'll see, um, you'll be able to purchase your lint kit ahead of time. Um, yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be, I'm really, really, really excited about this year. And I, oh wait, we, I don't have it handy. Uh, I'm going to tell you what our theme is, but the, but the whole thing is like unlocking, it's no, I am the key to my, I am, like I am all caps. I am the key to myself. And then on the inside of the bracelet, it's going to say, uh, I, I unlock my treasure, or something like that. I don't know. We're working on that. But we've got a bookmark, the bracelet, the book, the journal, a whole bunch of other stuff. Like it's gonna be a really robust kit. The affirmation cards, like this. We try to take this thing to the next level. <laughs> All right. So. Okay, Jordan. Jordan, stop. Okay, stop. Thank you guys so much for tonight. Have a lovely, lovely, lovely evening. Jordan. I'm excited. Jordan. <laughs> Hi, Jordan. Wear your clothes. All right. Anyway, <laughs> good night, you guys. This is he's Bye. getting back in the shower. Go, 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 go. Good night. Go turn it on for me. Go turn it on for me. Run in the wedding. Good night, guys. Good night. <laughs>